Hello again, and thank you for clicking on my video. Now, if you've seen some of my other videos, you'll know by now that my name is Alex, and I'm an actor and a writer. I live in Tasmania, in Australia, where we have lots of animals and plants that haven't changed for thousands, sometimes millions of years. However, none of them are quite as old as dinosaurs. And the story you're about to hear is another one in my series set in Dinosaur Dell, which is a village entirely populated by dinosaurs and other prehistoric reptiles. This is story number 17 in the series, and it's the story of Nanny Nanuxaurus. And do stick around at the end of the story for some information on my characters and maybe some ideas that you can try out at home. Under the volcano. And not too far from the sulphur springs and the pits of tar. In the middle of a forest of tall tree ferns, you'll find some houses where the footpath turns. This is where I live. <laughs> Tell from the roars, my neighbours are all dinosaurs. I'm Alex the Alxosaurus. Hello. Now, once upon 70 million years ago, wait, which of the stories shall I tell about the dinosaurs living in Dinosaur Dell? The story of Nanny Nanuxaurus. At the end of a quiet cul-de-sac, with a peaceful garden out the back, far from the noise of the rest of the dell, lives the dinosaur whose story I'm going to tell. This is where she lives. You can tell from the snores. This is the home for very old dinosaurs. And those loud snores were coming from the two rooms on the ground floor. In one of those two rooms live Grandma and Grandpa and Hangwara, and they spend most of their time asleep. And in the other of those two rooms live Oma and Opa Mea Zora, and they spend most of their time asleep too. On the first floor are two more rooms. One of them has been empty for ever so long. And in the other, overlooking the garden, lives Nanny Nanuxaurus. Although she's all alone, she hardly ever sleeps. She sits with her pet iguana on her lap, watching the bees and butterflies and the little Archaeopteryxes in the garden. Through the tall ginkgo trees that grow at the back of the garden, you can just see the school, and Nanny Nanuxaurus loves to watch the children playing outside on sunny days too. A few weeks ago, the children had just come in from playtime, and Miss Pterodostro, the school teacher, was addressing her class. Now children, she said, folding her wings neatly behind her back, I thought that this term we might do a class project. We have so many dinosaurs, pterosaurs and plesiosaurs living in Dinosaur Dell who lead extraordinary lives. Rex the Tyrannosaurus, for example, is a famous actor. Dr Deinonychus and Constable Consignathus are always helping out people in the community. Not to mention how Professor Pteranodon won the Nobel Prize last year. Of course she mentioned it whispered Sally Struthiomimus. The professor's her cousin. Sally, snapped Miss Pterodostro. Pay attention. Now I want you all to pick a grown-up dinosaur or pterosaur in the dell and produce a project on what makes them so interesting. My daddy's a marathon runner. I'm going to write about him, said Sally smugly. And one more thing, said Miss Pterodostro with a toothy smile. Your project must be about a dinosaur who isn't a relative. I want you to learn about dinosaurs you don't know as well as your own mummies and daddies. 
Oh, poo, said Sally, but very quietly, so Miss Teradostro couldn't hear. And she waited until the teacher's back was turned to stick her tongue out at her. Well, Sally wasted no time in going to see Dr Deinonychus after school. She knows I'll do the best project. Dr Deinonychus is the most important dinosaur in Dinosaur Dell, she boasted the next day at playtime. It seemed that everyone had found a grown-up that they thought would make the best project. Fontaine, the Marshasaurus, had chosen Madame Yavalandia. She runs her own dance school. Cousteau, the Plesiosaurus, had chosen Quentin Quisitosaurus. He's the bear of the whole of Dinosaur Dell. Hugh, the Epidexipteryx, had chosen Lady Albertina, the Styracosaurus. She's ever so important, and she knows so many famous dinosaurs. Yes, everyone had found someone, except for little Jake, the Wee Warasaurus. Oh dear, he said to himself. I think everyone's been taken. Ha, said Sally, unkindly. You'll never find anyone as good as a doctor. But Jake could think of someone as good as the doctor. Nurse Nyctosaurus, who helped Dr Deinonychus at her surgery. However, that afternoon, Nurse Nyctosaurus wasn't at the surgery. Oh, he's over at the old dinosaur's home, explained Dr Deinonychus. He helps out there a few afternoons a week, you see. Well, that was even better, thought Jake. But Nurse Nyctosaurus wasn't much help. Oh, I'm sorry, Jake. Zanjalsaurus has already asked me if you can do his project on me. I was very flattered. I'm sure you'll find someone you can do your project on, though. Jake wasn't so sure, though. He walked past the bedrooms on the ground floor of the old dinosaur's home. In one, Oma and Opa Meiazora were fast asleep, holding hands and snoring. In another, Grandma and Grandpa and Hanguera were fast asleep, holding wings and snoring. Just as he reached the front door, a large iguana scuttled in front of him. Goodness, said Jake, where did you come from? Of course, the iguana didn't answer, but clambered up the stairs. Jake followed him curiously as the lizard slid around the door of the second bedroom on the landing. A little old dinosaur in a shawl picked the iguana up and hugged him. Oh, there you are, she exclaimed, and started singing quietly to him. Iguana be loved by you, just you and nobody else but you. Oh, hello, she said as she caught sight of Jake. A visitor? I didn't mean to disturb you, said Jake. In fact, I shouldn't really be here. I have a school project I should be getting on with. It's about dinosaurs who have extraordinary lives. Oh, well, my life isn't very extraordinary now, said Nanny. In fact, most of the time, I just sit here and watch the garden. I don't even get many visitors. I don't suppose you'd like a cup of tea. I have biscuits, too. Well, said Jake, I suppose my project could wait a little bit longer. A few minutes later, they were sat drinking tea and eating biscuits together. Jake suddenly felt shy and wasn't sure what to say. Who's that? he asked, looking at a painting on the wall. It was a handsome young Polacanthus. He had a kind face and was smiling. Oh, that picture is from ever so long ago, said Nanny when I was hardly more than a hatchling living in Laramedia. Where is Laramedia? asked Jake. Oh, Laramedia is far away to the north, said Nanny, and our winters were often cold, but our summers were beautiful. Oh, when I was a young dinosaur, I liked nothing better than to walk in the meadows and the woods. I loved to sit by the river and paint the trees and the birds and the dragonflies. And one day, whilst I was painting in my favourite spot by the river, the most handsome young Polacanthus walked past. Was that the dinosaur in the picture? asked Jake. It was, said Nanny. 
He'd walk past every morning whilst I was painting, and he would always smile at me. And so I would smile back, and one day I painted his picture too. Did you talk to him? asked Jake. I was too shy, said Nanny, and by the time I plucked up the courage, it was too late. Too late, said Jake. Yes, Nanny replied. You see, I'd been offered the chance to study biology. That's the science of animals and plants. I had the choice of Shale University or Roxford University. I picked Shale University. I was the first lady dinosaur to study there, but it meant leaving my home in Laramedia and travelling all the way to Laurentia. Did you see the Polacanthus again? before you had to leave? Jake asked curiously. No, said Nanny wistfully, but I did receive a letter from him. I still have it here. And she took from her drawer a very old letter indeed. All it said was, I am sorry we have never had the chance to meet, but I am as shy as you are. I know you have to go away, and I do too, for I am an explorer and have many lands to travel. But I know our paths will cross again one day, and that wherever in the world we are, we will always be friends. Wear this to keep you safe. It's my lucky fossil, and I want you to have it with you always. And I still wear it now, said Nanny, and showed Jake the beautiful polished ammonite that hung on a chain around her neck. I wore it all the way through my studies too, Nanny continued, and it must have been lucky because in my final year at Shale University, I was picked for the Laurentia Croquet team at the Dinolympics. Quite an honour. We competed against teams from everywhere. Gondwanaland, Laurasia, Pampia and all the islands in the Tethys Sea. There was also a team from Laramedia, and who should be on it but that Polacanthus I'd seen by the river. They were the last team we had to play against, and I was so nervous that I might get to meet him afterwards that I missed my last shot. I hit the little ball with the mallet, and it went wide of the hoop I'd aimed at. But without anyone noticing, the handsome dinosaur knocked it in with his foot. And through the hoop it went. Shale University were the Dinolympic champions. He helped you win, said Jake. Did you get to meet him afterwards? No, said Nanny, shaking her head. When we won, the spectators all ran onto the court to congratulate us, and I lost him in the crowd. I would so wanted to say thank you. What happened then? said Jake, after a pause. Well, I graduated from Shale University and became a biologist. I studied animals and plants and decided I should go exploring. There were lots of rare animals living on the remote islands around the Tethian Trench, and I wanted to be the first biologist to study them. So off I started on my travels on the biggest, fastest boat ever built by dinosaur, the Titanosaurid. Jake felt sure he'd heard of the boat called the Titanosaurid before, but he couldn't remember where. We sailed for weeks, Nanny went on, through seas full of flying fish, seas full of sargassum weed, and seas full of icebergs. And one late evening, as I was walking the deck wrapped up against the cold, I caught sight of someone I knew. Who was it? asked Jake. It was that same handsome Polacanthus, said Nanny. This time I was determined to meet him, but just as I was about to wave at him, something terrible happened. What? cried Jake on the edge of his seat. The ship hit an iceberg. Oh, there was a terrible crash, and the Titanosaurid began to lurch from side to side. It was going to overturn. 
The dinosaurs on board were all panicking, and the captain ordered us to jump into the lifeboats, but there weren't enough. I reached one, but it was quite full already. Oh no! Jake cried, horrified. There in the lifeboat, said Nanny, was my handsome Polacanthus. Without a word, he leapt out and, despite my protests, bundled me into the boat. Within seconds, the lifeboat was on the water as the sailors rowed us away from the sinking ship. What happened to the Polacanthus? asked Jake. That I don't know, said Nanny. I looked back and saw him standing on the prow of the ship as it sank. You saved me. Thank you. I must know your name. I called to him. But over the noise of the waves and the panicking passengers, I couldn't hear it. Poor Polacanthus, said Jake, after a pause. But did you make it safely to land? I did, thanks to him said Nanny, and after much travelling and seeing many rare animals and plants, I arrived on the most far-flung island of the Tethys Trench, where I found the rarest of all. There, in the deepest swamp, in the deepest jungle, under a range of huge volcanoes, I found an Anthracosaurus. What's that? asked Jake. Oh, an extraordinary animal. They went extinct long before we dinosaurs even appeared, as far back as the Carboniferous millions of years ago. But there she was, as large as life, which is very large indeed. Sharp teeth and scaly skin and a body like a huge eel. Well, I didn't want to get too close, but I waded into the swamp and made some sketches to bring back with me. I headed back through the jungle to my boat, but as I made my way there, there was an ominous rumble. The ground shook, and I looked up to see one of the huge volcanoes explode with a red-hot lava. Rocks showered down all around me, and I froze in horror as a terrible ball of boiling gas, ash and dust rolled down the slopes at a hundred miles an hour right towards me. What on earth did you do? asked Jake, open-mouthed. You'll never believe it, said Nanny, because I didn't believe it then. Out of the trees suddenly appeared my handsome Polacanthus. He seized me by the hand, and in a split second we were on a cliff overlooking the Tethys Trench. Jump, he said, and claw in claw, we jumped. Down deep into the water we went as the cloud of boiling gas, ash and dust passed over us. When I could hold my breath no longer, up I came. Alone. Somewhere in the water. I had lost him. Oh no, said Jake, sadly. I don't know how, said Nanny. But I found my little boat and rowed away from the erupting island as fast as I could. And quite some time after that, I found myself back in Laurentia, where I exhibited my sketches of all the rare animals and plants I'd seen. But whilst I was looking through my backpack, you'll never guess what I found. What? asked Jake eagerly. A baby Anthracosaurus. She must have climbed in there when I was in the swamp. Of course, I couldn't take her back to the island, so we built her a little enclosure near Central Shark Lake, where we thought she'd be happy. And over the years, I would go and visit her between my travels to discover new animals and plants. But on my last visit, Nanny went on, the Anthracosaurus had grown enormous. And a full-sized Anthracosaurus is a dangerous thing. In fact, she'd gobbled up most of the sharks in Central Shark Lake, and feeling hungry, she broke through her enclosure and went on a rampage through the city. Dinosaurs and pterosaurs ran and flew headlong out of her way. But I felt responsible for her. After all, I'd brought her all the way from her home, even though I'd done it by accident. 
so I chased after her until she got to the entire slate building, which is the tallest building in all Laurentia, made from one huge sheet of fossil slate. Now, I thought she'd stop there, but she climbed up and up, right to the top, all 400 metres. Pterosaurs circled her in panic as she swiped at them with her claws. And I followed her, climbing all that way up, never daring to look down. But when I got to the top, all I could do was try to calm her. I had no way to get her down. So what did you do? asked Jake. Well, who should appear climbing up the entire slate building just at that moment? asked Nanny in reply. Not, began Jake. Yes, answered Nanny. My handsome Polacanthus. He stretched out his hand to the Anthracosaurus, and I recognised in his hands some pieces of puffball fungi. Now, you know you must never eat fungi because many of them are poisonous. But these ones were so small, and the Anthracosaurus was so large, that all they did was send her off to sleep. And as she dozed, her grip loosened on the side of the entire slate building, and she fell off. Luckily, at the bottom of the building, there are lots of soft bushes, and she fell into those, so was quite unharmed. But as she fell, one of her claws caught me, and down I went too. I was only a little dizzy from the fall, but when I looked up to see if my handsome Polacanthus was there, there was no sign of him at all. It was many years before I saw him again, said Nanny, smiling. My travels took me everywhere, and I felt sure that my handsome Polacanthus must be out there somewhere exploring the world. And one day it happened that I was invited to a party to celebrate my achievements as a biologist. Now, one of the guests at the party was the painter Madame Monoclonius. She was as quick-tempered as she was short-sighted, and she thought my painting of the handsome Polacanthus that was displayed with all my other paintings was of her husband, Monsieur Monoclonius. Before I knew it, she had bellowed, I will teach you to paint other dinosaurs' husbands. I challenge you to a duel. And before I could stop her, we were back to back and then taking ten paces away from one another. One. Two. Three. Jake was riveted. Eight. Nine. Ten, counted Nanny. And then she came galloping towards me, her nose horn lowered. All I could do was try to jump out of the way, but Madame Monoclonius swerved with me and her nose horn drove straight towards my heart. Oh no, cried Jake. But... Just as it was about to touch me, the lucky fossil which my handsome Polacanthus had given me, that I always wore around my neck, swung across my heart, and Madame's nose horn glanced harmlessly off of it. I had been saved again by my handsome Polacanthus, and he wasn't even there. Of course, by this time, Nanny went on, Madame Monoclonius had realised her mistake and she was very apologetic. I should think so, said Jake indignantly. But I decided it was high time I left Laurentia anyway, said Nanny. I had no reason to return to Laramedia, for I had no family left there, and I was old enough by then to feel the cold of those winters. So I thought I would try somewhere warmer, she laughed. <laughs> but I thought it was time to, for one last big adventure to get me there. I used all the sketches I had made of birds to build a flying machine. I was determined to become the first dinosaur to fly. And so I built a machine with wings and a tail like a bird, and I managed to get it to rise into the air. And as I took off from the coast of Laurentia, I looked down, and there, on the beach, was my handsome Polacanthus. He waved one paw at me, and I tried desperately to fly my flying machine down to him. But the wind caught the wings and blew me further out to sea. 
and when I looked again, he had vanished. And a few days later, I crash-landed just outside a little town hidden in a forest of tall tree ferns. Dinosaur Dell, said Jake. Yes, said Nanny. And for a while, I helped at the school here, but then I retired, and with nowhere else to go, I ended up here, with my pet iguana and my lovely view of the garden. But all alone. And her smile faded. Well, said Jake, you're not alone now. I'll come and visit you every day after school. Oh, I'd like that, said Nanny. But I know you have your school project to do. You ought to go and find a dinosaur who has an extraordinary life. I think I already found one, said Jake, smiling at Nanny. And that's almost the end of my story. You can guess the rest. Of all the class's projects, Jake's was quite the best. I know doctors and professors, Miss Teradostro said. But goodness me, the life your nanny Nanuxaurus led. From the way she is today, I never would have guessed. Never judge a reptile by her scales. I'm really most impressed. Jake still visits Nanny. They share stories over tea. And when he went there yesterday, well, what did he see? Nanny wasn't in her room. She was in the one next door. The one that had been empty. But it wasn't anymore. Look who's come to live here. We've met properly at last. And now we have a future as exciting as our past. Nanny's not alone now, with my story at an end. She's got Marco Polacanthus, her new and lifelong friend. Here's some more about my story. Nanny is a Nanuxaurus, which was unusual for a dinosaur. Her name means polar bear lizard because she lived in Laramedia, an ancient continent made up of the land that now makes up Alaska. Nanoxaurus lived there when it would have been very cold, with dark winters, so she would have been adapted for very low temperatures for a dinosaur. Now, there are some things in this story you should definitely never try. Never ever go near an erupting volcano. The boiling gas, ash and dust clouds that volcanoes produce are called pyroclastic flows. The fastest travel at 430 miles per hour, that's 700 kilometres per hour, and are very hot, 1000 degrees Celsius or 1830 degrees Fahrenheit. You won't have to avoid Anthracosaurus, though. Even though she was three metres, or ten feet long, and had a mouthful of razor-sharp teeth, she died out in the Carboniferous period, 310 million years ago. And the only freshwater sharks alive today are very rare. They live in the Ganges River in India, and in Papua New Guinea, where only 250 of one species are left. Don't ever eat fungi, though. Although the mushrooms you have for dinner are delicious, a lot of fungi are deadly poisonous. The giant puffball is edible, though, and burning pieces of it used to be used to put bees to sleep so that beekeepers could take the honey from their hives. There are things you can try, though. Croquet is a fun game for summer. You have to knock a small ball through hoops with a mallet. Or you might want to tell your own story like Nanny. You could tell a one-word story with friends, for example. You all sit in a circle. One person says a single word to begin a story. Then the person on her left says another word. Then the next person says another word, and so on and so on around the circle. The goal is to tell a story that makes sense as a team, one word at a time. I play this a lot with my friends, 
and the stories can be very funny and very silly. Or you might like to tell a story in pairs. This is a fun game to test your skills at improvising, which is just a fancy way of saying making things up. One of you is the storyteller and the other is the story interrupter. The story interrupter suggests a subject for a story and the storyteller starts telling it. But if the story interrupter doesn't like a particular thing in the story, he can interrupt and demand a change. So it might start like this. <clears throat> there was once a little Tyrannosaurus. No. Uh, a little Stegosaurus. No. Uh, a little Iguana, who lived in a tree. No. Uh, who lived in the sea. No. Uh, who went to school in the sea. And so on. See how inventive you can be, and how fast you can think. Well, thank you for joining me for a story from Dinosaur Dell. I hope that you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed writing it and telling it. Now one day I'd obviously like to turn all of my Dinosaur Dell stories into storybooks that anyone can read at home, perhaps using some of the character drawings and photos of Tasmania that you saw on the screen while I was reading the story. I'd love to hear from you, so if you enjoyed the story, or you'd just like to say hello, or even better, tell me who your favourite dinosaur is, please let me know in the comments below, or do visit my website www.alexscottfairley.com, and hopefully I'll see you next time for another story from Dinosaur Dell. Bye for now.